following message was recorded at The Way. For additional messages and information, log on to our website, www.thewaycolumbus.com, or email us at thewaycolumbus at gmail.com. Now, get ready to hear a word from God. Open up your hearts and your spirits as we look at Mark chapter 1. Um, we're going to start reading at verse 16. And I'm going to be reading out of the HCSD version of the Bible. And uh, the, you can just follow along in the version you read. Verse 16, Mark chapter 1. As he was preaching, as he was passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother. They were casting a net into the sea since they were fishermen. Follow me, verse 17. Jesus told them, and I will make you fish for people. Verse 18, immediately. Everybody say immediately. Immediately. They followed him. They left their nets and they followed him. So far, the reading of the scripture, let's just uh, pray one more time just to tune it up just a little bit more. Uh, Father, we come to you tonight. We thank you, God, for this word. We thank you for this time of study and prayer that we're about to enter into and embark on as a ministry. We ask you, Father, that you would speak in our midst. We ask you, Father, that we would not take this moment lightly. We ask you, Father God, that every time that we hear the word of God, that we take it as a, as a serious time and opportunity. Do that for us tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. I ask you that you would teach us, instruct us, encourage us, reprove us, rebuke us. But whatever you do tonight, don't leave us the same way that we came in this place. And I pray that you answer prayers tonight as we move even deeper in our time tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. amen. I am a disciple of Jesus Christ. Tonight I want to speak from the topic called to discipleship. Everybody say call, call. To, discipleship. to discipleship. What I want us to understand in these few moments that we have tonight in the word is that there is a difference between being saved and being a disciple. How many of us are saved? How many of us have at some point, accepted the Lord Jesus as our Lord and as our Savior. Amen. Everybody, everybody in the room's hands have gone up that we are saved. Tell somebody and tell them, hell is not my future home. Hell is not my future home. Hell is not my Matter of fact, I'm going through enough hell right now. Shondo. I'm going through enough hell right now that I don't need no future hell in my life. So I'm saved and I'm sanctified. And if I walk out this building tonight and get hit by a bus, I'm going to heaven. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everybody happy about that? Excited about that? That heaven is your home? So, uh, but there's a difference. There's a difference between being saved and being a disciple. When we look at the definition of the word disciple, you can find that in Webster's Dictionary. It says, a disciple is one who accepts and assists in the spreading, in spreading the teachings of another. They accept and they assist in spreading the teachings of another. It also says one of the twelve in the inner circle of Christ's followers according to the gospel accounts. It also says that a disciple is a convinced adherent of a school or individual. In other words, you can be saved and not be a disciple. You can be saved and not be a convinced adherent. Many people have prayed a sinner's prayer. 
as it's called. Many people have went down to an altar and cried and repented of their sins and accepted the Lord Jesus as their Savior. But there are not as many people who have made him Lord. Uh, how do I make that more plain? There are not many people who have made Jesus their boss. Ask somebody, is Jesus really your boss? Or is this just a part-time gig? Is Jesus really your boss? Or is this a part-time... What do you mean, Pastor Sean, is Jesus my boss? I mean, can he tell you what to do? And you'll do it. Can he tell you to apologize? Even if you've apologized 50 times and you don't feel you're at fault. Can he tell you to forgive someone although they have offended you? And you have a right to be angry. And you have a right to be upset. Can he tell you what to do with your money? I, I, I'm not talking about Jesus being your Savior. I'm talking about Jesus being your Lord. Is he your Lord tonight? Or is he just a free ticket from hell? See, what you have to understand is that here we are not called to just have, assemble church members. Here we're not just called to get people saved. For the mandate of the church was not simply to get people to pray a prayer and accept Christ. But the mandate of the body of Christ was to go into every nation and make disciples. Make disciples. Make people who are convinced adherents of the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, I'm not just one who accepts and assists in the spreading of the gospel. I'm not just one who is convinced of the reality of Jesus Christ. I am one who is a strict adherent to everything he teaches. I'm a strict adherent. I believe every word of it. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. And I endeavor, I don't always hit it, but I endeavor to follow everything that the Lord Jesus teaches. For he told them, not only do I want you to make disciples, but the true sign of a disciple is that they follow all of my commandments. They follow everything that I teach. We are not called just to be churchgoers. And we are not called just to have a free ticket from heaven to heaven. We are called to be disciples. <clears throat> we are called to follow the examples and the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. Can somebody say, I want to be a disciple? I want to be a disciple. I may not be a disciple, but I want to be a disciple. I may not be living <coughs> the way that I should live in every area of my life, but I want to be. A disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's what I want you to understand. Jesus. That this walk. That we walk by. Is not only a walk of faith. But it's a walk of discipline. It's not just a walk of faith. It's a walk of discipline. Sometimes people believe. That faith. Is an absence of discipline. Discipline is not needed when you have faith. But I want to submit to you that faith produces discipline. What you believe produces how you live your life. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you truly believe the word of the Lord, then it will produce a lifestyle that lines up with what you believe. 
Following God goes against everything we are as human beings. It just does. You know? Because as a human being, I want to defend myself. As a human being, I want to get revenge on people. As a human being, I want to be angry and I want to give you a piece of my mind. As a human being, that's just that's just being human. Somebody say that's just being human. That's being human. You see what I'm saying? As a human being, I want to live in comfort. I want to be loved. I want to have me a man by my side. I want to have me a woman by just as a human being. As a human being, I might do things to have those things that may not be moral or may not be ethical. That's just being human. But when we begin to follow the Lord Jesus, he begins to require things of us that goes against our nature. And that's why he has to infuse in us a new nature. We have been given access to a new nature, and that is the nature of the Lord Jesus Christ. So though we still are subject to the Adamic nature, there's a greater nature that is down on the inside of us by Christ Jesus that enables us to aspire to live in a way that is beyond what is our tendencies. We've all got tendencies. We've all got things that uh, we that that is a part of us that is contrary to the Word of God. But God is saying that when you put your faith in my word above your own knowledge, above your own opinion, above your own will, then you're able to tap into a power in God that enables you to live a life that is beyond what you are able to live. What we have to understand is that we cannot follow Christ from a distance. You can't follow Christ from a distance. When you look at this text, Jesus approached men that were doing their thing. How many of you know that some of us were found by Jesus? Because I don't believe we found Jesus. I believe we were found by Jesus. Some of us were found by Jesus and we were doing our thing. See, I reject the notion that everybody that comes to God comes to God from a place of desperation. These men were fishing. They weren't desperate. They were just doing their job. Right. They weren't in some brothel or some, you know, Jesus, he, he dealt with people that was on that level. But not everybody he called were people who were in some type of desperate circumstance or situation. I want to tell you that Jesus is not just the Jesus of the desperate. Jesus is not, salvation is not just something for losers. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. See, see, we sometimes preach a gospel that's geared towards one segment of people. Yeah. But it doesn't speak to everybody because everybody ain't broke. Right. Everybody don't need Jesus for some money. Ain't that the truth? Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. Everybody don't need Jesus to get a man. Some people got a man. Some people got a husband and a wife already. Some people have already gotten their career together. And they don't need Jesus for that. So we have to present something that is beyond just somebody's situation being better. The gospel is not about situational uh, betterness. Right. You see what I'm saying? It's about a soul transformation. Yeah. And whether you are rich or whether you are poor, mm -hmm. we all need transformation in the soul. Yes. Because you might have money, but money don't mean you got peace. Mm -hmm. You don't hear what I'm saying. You might have a mate, but it doesn't mean that you know what real love is. See, so when we begin to, when Jesus begins to call people, he calls people from every walk of life. The gospel is powerful enough to reach the attorney, just like it's powerful enough to reach the high school dropout. So Jesus is walking and come across these men that's doing their thing. They're doing what they've learned, their trade, what they're good at doing. And right in the middle 
of them doing their thing, Jesus interrupts them. And Jesus says, follow me. See, you got to understand that everybody will get a call to discipleship, but not everybody will answer. Everybody will get the opportunity to follow Jesus, but not everybody will be willing to walk away from what they have to walk away from to follow him. Sometimes being a disciple of Jesus Christ means you got to walk away from some things. These men walked away from lucrative professions to follow Jesus. It was lucrative to be a fisherman. As a matter of fact, Galilee was a seaport city. So the people who were successful were the people who were able to have boats and get out and fish. So, so Jesus is saying here, he said, listen, he says, come follow me and I'll take what you do and I'll put it on another level. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. I I'm talking about making disciples. I'm talking about calling people from where they are to another place and giving them a new, uh, a, a, a new paradigm to follow. Jesus says, I'm going to show you how I can take what you do in the natural and flip it and make it work for me in the spiritual. You know about fishing for natural fish, but I'm going to show you how to fish for people. And look at this. It says immediately. Everybody say immediately. 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 immediately they left their nets and followed him. How many of us have always take time when God calls you? See, this is how you know you're dealing with a disciple. Because a disciple responds immediately to the word of their master. If you want to know who your master is, who your Lord is, look at what you respond to immediately. The Lord says, I want you to get up, I want you to pray. Oh, Satan, the Lord rebuke you, I got to be to work in two hours, that ain't God. God ain't going to ask me to get up out of my comfortable warm bed and pray at six o'clock in the morning. But the disciple says, immediately. Yes, Lord. See, God is trying here to call us to discipleship. Suddenly we say, who will pick up the mantle? But you have to understand that picking up the mantle requires a deeper level of discipleship. It requires a deeper level of discipline. My God. See, when Pastor Kendall and I sat up here, up here, and 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 moved from being licensed pastors to being ordained pastors to being set aside for this work, it was literally a different level of discipleship we were being called to. See, we always think of promotion as a different level of authority. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. We always think of promotion in God as a higher level of this and a greater level of that. And I'm going to be more powerful and, and more anointed. And you know what I found out? My anointing has not changed. Hello? I am not one ounce more anointed than I was three weeks ago. Not one ounce. Whatever I got, I still got it. Do you know what's changed? The call of discipleship. That's what's changed. God be in my ear more like, nope. <laughs> Get it together. That ain't right. Apollo. What? Where the power at? 
Jesus. I'm ready to see miracles and healings. And God, you know what God says? He says, when you when you don't come to that next level of discipleship, I can't use you like that. Because I can't trust someone who's undisciplined. I can't trust someone who can't control their mouth. Y'all don't hear me. I can't trust someone whose passions are out of control. If I give you more power, if I give you more anointing, if I give you more influence, you're going to mess it up. I didn't even want to say mess. You're going to mess it up. You're going to mess it up. See, discipleship is the first level of promotion. My when Jesus called these men, they were called into promotion. But the first level of promotion was a clamp down on their lifestyle. My God. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. A clamp down on their lifestyle. Now, I know you want to fish, but you got to follow for a while. I know you want to be great, but you got to humble yourself now. And you got to listen, and you got to be taught, and you got to let me do something in your heart and in your mind. Discipleship. Somebody say discipleship. discipleship. Yeah, he's calling us. He's calling us to a greater level of discipleship. That is the first stage of promotion. So before we shout and before we fall out about what God is getting ready to do in the spooky natural. Because you know that's all church people care about is the spooky natural. He says, I want more of your time. Now I'm here. A disciple. I want more of your time. I want more of your talent. I want more of your resources. You don't hear me. That's being a disciple. That when the master asks for more, yes. My goodness. My goodness. When the master challenges your mindset, yes. When the master challenges your attitude, yes. When the master says, Oh, you a little faith, how much longer will I deal with you? You say, Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. If you want to, if you want to spank me, yes, Lord. If you want me to give it up, yes, Lord. If you want me to let it go, yes, Lord. That is the first level of promotion. That's how you know you're on the road to your destiny. When your yes changes. We're being called. We're being called. As the way. We're being called. Out of our comfort zone. Because how many of you know. Self-sacrifice is not comfortable. I said self-sacrifice is not comfortable. Doing what I don't want to do because I know it's right to do is not comfortable. But the disciple will do what they don't want to do. Because I am fully convinced enough to adhere to everything my master teaches me. I'm fully convinced. I'm fully convinced. I am convinced that his word works. And when we are convinced that his word works, we'll work the word. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. When you're convinced that this works, you'll get off the phone when you got an issue and you'll get in this to get some answers. You'll get on your face to get some answers. Instead of calling everybody. Asking them what you think. And what do you think I should do? And what do you think I should do? And how do you think I should handle it? This is the level. This is the level of being a disciple. So you can trust and believe whenever you come here. You're not going to hear a word that's going to allow you to stay where you are. I don't care who's up here. 
You're not going to hear a word that's going to tickle your ears. You're not going to hear a word that's going to allow you to continue thinking the way you think and living the way you live and treat people the way you treat them. You're going to hear a word that calls you to another level, that calls you to reflect Christ because that is what the way Columbus has been called to do. You want to know what the vision is? That's the vision. We're calling people to be like Jesus. We're living and we're endeavoring to be like Christ. We're endeavoring to love like Christ, to forgive. I was talking to somebody on the phone today, and they asked me a question. They said, well, where does enough enough? Isn't there a limit to mercy? And you know what I said? I said, well, in the flesh there is a limit. I said, but then... When I think about it, wouldn't it be hypocritical of me, uh, of me as a believer to put a limit on my mercy but expect no limits on God's mercy? And if I'm indeed a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, endeavoring to live like Christ, it would stand the reason that I would bend towards His style of mercy rather than man's. The bottom line is, to the natural man, mercy is foolish. And I said, if mercy is foolish, then we must be serving the biggest fool in the universe. Because his mercy is everlasting. My God. His mercy is everlasting. So you ask yourself, should I forgive again? And the answer is, would Jesus forgive again? You ask yourself, should I let it go? And the answer would be, how many times has Jesus let it go? My God. You ask yourself, should I trust again? And the answer would be, how many times did Jesus trust? Jesus trusted from the beginning. Jesus opened himself up knowing from the beginning that he chose a betrayer. He said, one of you is a devil. What kind of love does the master have that we should be discipled in that causes you to deal with people that you know are Judas's? That you know when you sit when it came out of your mouth, they ain't gonna keep the secret. But a disciple is a convinced adherent that the way of my master is better than my way. And I endeavor to live my life. I endeavor to be an imitator of God. That's what the Bible says. Be ye imitators of God. What would Jesus do was a cute slogan. And it became nothing more than wristbands. Because people did not embrace the reality of what was being said. The question is for a disciple, not for a Christian. Because only a disciple would seriously stop and consider how would my Lord want me to handle this situation? I know what I feel like doing, but I am not my own. I have been bought with a price. We're being called. We're being called. We're being called. We're being called. We're being called to discipleship. Do you hear the call, not of Pastor Sean, not of Pastor Kendall? Do you hear the call of the Lord Jesus himself echoing from the realm of the Spirit saying, Come up, follow me. Come up, follow me. Follow me. Follow me. And I will make you Fisher of men. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. 
We hope this message has enriched your life. For more information, log on to our website, www.thewaycolumbus.com, or email us at thewaycolumbus at gmail.com. And remember, Jesus is the way.